Friday the 13th, a day that is feared for being unlucky by the superstitious, like a black cat crossing your path or the breaking of a mirror. For the Ralph family, Friday the 13th of April 1973 would not only be unlucky, but would be the day that everything changed. For Elsie and Clive Ralph, it was the last day that they would see their children, Paul, Dawn and Samantha, alive. Hi everyone and welcome to episode two of the Students' Verdict podcast. If you haven't already, please go and listen to episode one. For those of you who are new, my name is Emily and I am your host. Please follow us on Instagram at the Student Verdict blog and on Twitter at Student Verdict. Resources used in this episode will always be linked in the show notes. Now, before we get started, a quick warning. In today's episode, we will be discussing graphic and violent details of the deaths of three children. This episode may therefore not be appropriate for all ages and listener discretion is advised. With that said, let's get started on today's episode. Clive Ralph had been school friends. They later married in September 1968 when Elsie was 16 and pregnant with her first child. Elsie gave birth to Paul in 1968 and then to Dawn Maria who was born in 1971. Clive Ralph was employed by his father as a lorry driver. The Ralphs lived on Gillam Street in Worcester, a town 45 minutes from the city of Birmingham. In 1972, David McGreevy moved in with Clive, Elsie, Paul and Dawn. When he moved in, Elsie was pregnant with the Ralph's third child, Samantha Jane, who would be born in September 1972. The house on Gillam Street was a two-bedroom house with six occupants, three adults and three children. McGreevy therefore had to share a bedroom with Paul, while Samantha and Dawn slept in their parents' room. Safe to say it was pretty crowded, but Elsie explained in an interview that it had been her and Clive's intention to find a bigger home, but they never had the chance. David Anthony McGreevy was born in Southport, Lancashire in 1951 to parents Thomas and Bella McGreevy. He was the second of six children. Thomas, McGreevy's father, was a sergeant in the British Army, meaning that the family moved frequently. According to McGreevy's mother, Bella, Living in Germany was his happiest time. She recalled that the only time her son caused her any real trouble was when they were living in Cardiff and he stole her shopping money, which he used to travel to Liverpool. In 1967, 15-year-old David left school and fulfilled his ambition of joining the Royal Navy. In the late 1960s, he was based at Southampton Naval Base, where he joined his first ship, HMS Eagle. During his time in the Navy, McGreevy was subject to a number of disciplinary procedures. At RNAS Broadie in Pembrokeshire, McGreevy was working as a steward in the mess hall when he saw his name in a chief petty officer's notebook. He thought that this was an indication of a change of job, which made him very upset. After he'd been drinking, he broke into an officer's wardroom and set fire to a bin with papers in it. He claimed it was an accident but he was court-martialed, meaning he appeared before a military court. He was found not guilty of arson, but guilty of negligence, and was sentenced to 90 days' detention. After this incident, the Navy had him psychiatrically tested. The results of this test have never been released. In 1971, David McGreevy was shore-based at Portsmouth Dockyard. It was during this time that he began writing to his friend's sister, Mary. They exchanged two letters a week from January to April. In April 1971, McGreevy met Mary for the first time, and just one week later, he proposed. Mary saw McGreevy for two long weekends in June and July, and he continued writing to her three times a week, each letter five or six pages long. In August 1971, McGreevy's career in the Navy ended after he was dismissed. This began his downward spiral. The second blow came when Mary called off their engagement on New Year's Eve. She said that she shouldn't have said yes to the proposal as it was too early and indicated that he felt more strongly for her than she did for him. So by 1972, McGreevy was living with his parents again. He had no income 
and no fiancé. His parents eventually asked him to leave after he refused to help around the house or look for a job. This was when he approached the Ralphs, asking Clive if he could put him up until he found somewhere else to go. The Ralphs welcomed a desperate McGreevy into their home as a lodger. What happened next was the stuff of nightmares. When Samantha was seven months old, Elsie got a job as a barmaid at a pub called the Punch Bowl, which was around two miles from the Ralphs' home. With Clive regularly away for work, McGreevy would often act as a babysitter for the Ralph children. According to Elsie, he frequently played with the two older children, Paul and Dawn, and would, quote, act like a father. Elsie recalled how he even berated her once over her discipline of Paul, telling her not to cuff him again. On Friday the 13th of April 1973, Clive went and picked a drunk McGreevy up from the Bucks Hill pub, asking him to look after the children whilst he went to pick Elsie up from work. Clive would usually pick Elsie up late in order to help her clean up and have a last pint. McGreevy was drunk, having consumed between five and seven pints, and so was arguably not in a fit state to look after children. Presumably, Clive was confident that McGreevy would be fine, as when Clive left to get Elsie, his children were all in bed asleep. When Clive and Elsie returned home later that evening, there were police cars outside their home address. Suddenly worried, they asked an officer what was going on. The pair were escorted to the police station, where they were told the terrible and traumatic news that their three children, Paul, Dawn and Samantha, had been murdered. In an interview with reporters, the mother was asked to recall the moment she was told the news that her children were dead. Elsie said, quote, As far as I can remember, the police were there. They said they needed to speak to us at the police station. And this is when they told us, you know, there had been a murder and there was an investigation going on. And that's as far as I can remember properly, because there was a doctor there at the time. I went hysterical, which you would, and he gave me an injection and, you know, I don't really... I never went back to the house. I wasn't allowed. And I was screaming, saying that I wanted to see my children. And they said we couldn't do that. But how had this awful crime happened? And where was their babysitter, David McGreevy? McGreevy was arrested by police at 3.50am on the morning after the Ralph children's murders. Police had found him walking along a street near the Ralph's home. Upon his arrest, McGreevy asked police, what's this all about? At the police station, McGreevy initially denied any responsibility. However, after several hours of interrogation, he simply said, It was me, but it wasn't me. It was then that he told police what had happened to the Ralph children. After Clive had left the house to go and pick his wife up, an inebriated McGreevy was left alone with Paul, Dawn and Samantha, who were all asleep. During the evening, McGreevy said he warmed a bottle for the youngest, eight-month-old Samantha, and gave it to her, but she wouldn't stop crying. Then, sometime between 10.15 and 11.15, McGreevy, who was known for his violent temper when he had been drinking, violently lashed out at Samantha. He explained, quote, I put my hand over her mouth and it went from there. It's all in the house. It would later be revealed that Samantha died from a skull fracture after her head was hit against a flat surface. Unfortunately, he did not stop there. McGreevy went on to reveal to police that he used a wire to strangle four-year-old Paul and he had slit the throat of two-year-old Dawn with a double-edged razor blade. But why did McGreevy kill the other children? It is reported by the Worcester News that Dawn and Paul were murdered in their own beds whilst they slept, and we know that they did not all sleep in one room. I wonder if they were disturbed by the crying of their younger sister and got up to investigate. Now, I'd like to pause here a moment. This is a murderer who used three different methods to murder his victims. Why? It suggests that he had time. In a frenzied attack that was done on impulse, he would have used the same method on all three. But no, he strangles one, beats another, and slits the throat of the third. So much violence against three non-threatening children, all under the age of five years old. Unfortunately, McGreevy didn't stop there either. To police, McGreevy explained that he wanted to bury the bodies, but he couldn't. So, after the three children were dead, 
McGreevy went down to the basement and retrieved a pickaxe. He mutilated the bodies of the three children before going outside and impaling all three of them on a neighbour's wrought iron fence. This is where the officers found their bodies. DCI Bob Booth said that no officer has ever had to witness such a scene of indescribable horror. One experienced murder detective was physically sick at the scene. The only explanation for this horrific attack seemed to be that the baby, Samantha, would not stop crying. Although, one newspaper, the Daily Mirror, in an article dated the 31st of July 1973, did write that McGreevy's crime was, quote, the slaughter of his mistress's three young children, but Elsie has always denied any suggestion that she was in a relationship with David McGreevy. What makes this case even more heartbreaking, if that's even possible, is that on the 18th of April 1973, Elsie Ralph, the children's mother, told the Birmingham Post that she was unable to have any more children. After the birth of her third child when she was 24 years old, Elsie was sterilised. She also told the news reporter that she never wanted to go back to her home on Gillam Street and was staying with a relative in Worcester. During the course of the police investigation, witnesses came forward. One such couple were Robin Harris and his fiancée Jane Perry, who had been staying at Jane's sister's house on Gillam Street. They claimed to have heard a dull thud at around 10.30pm. Robin wanted to go and investigate, but Jane asked him to wait until her brother-in-law was home. Later, Robin and his brother-in-law went to the address. They saw lights on in the Ralph house and the cellar. They heard another thud, but didn't see anything disturbing, so the men returned home. Another neighbour reported having seen a tall, thin man with shoulder-length hair in the garden of the property. Other neighbours say they did not hear or see anything that night. On the 16th of April 1973, David McGreevy was brought before Worcester Magistrates Court. After no application for bail was made by Mr Rivers Hickman, McGreevy was remanded into custody. Hickman then made a successful application for legal aid. The Liverpool Echo described the public gallery as crowded, largely made up of women, which was very unusual. McGreevy appeared in court ten times for remand hearings, before being sent to trial. On the 28th of June 1973, David McGreevy appeared before Worcester Crown Court. In a hearing that lasted eight minutes, McGreevy pleaded guilty. The hearing was so short because there was no defence plea, no real motive and no case of diminished responsibility. One reporter said that McGreevy looked down in court as if he had resigned to his fate. The reporter wrote that there was an atmosphere of anger and so the police didn't want McGreevy in court for too long. Sentencing was adjourned until the 30th of July 1973. At David McGreevy's sentencing, Mr John Fields QC, acting on behalf of the defence, urged the judge not to recommend a minimum sentence, saying that the offences were plainly the result of a sudden onset of some kind in McGreevy's mind, and that there was no suggestion that McGreevy had been preying on the public. Mr Justice Ashworth informed the court that McGreevy's crimes were so appalling and the risk of repetition so grave that he would sentence the defendant to multiple life sentences with a minimum term of 20 years, meaning he would have to serve at least 20 years before he could be considered for parole. According to the Liverpool Echo, Justice Ashworth carefully considered the psychiatrist's report, which stated that McGreevy was capable of such an act again. It read in part, quote, It will be a long time before those whose responsibility it will be to care for him can say with any degree of certainty that he is safe to be at large, if indeed it will ever be possible. The Liverpool Echo reported that Mr Fields, acting on behalf of the defendant, said that anyone hearing McGreevy's crimes would believe the perpetrator of such horrible crimes must be mad. However, both the prosecution and the defence were in agreement that there was no evidence to support an argument of legal insanity or impairment of any kind. In a documentary on YouTube called Friday the 13th Killer, David McGreevy, which I've linked in the show notes, Elsie was asked whether she felt the punishment handed down was enough. Elsie responded, quote, No, 
No, far from it. Not after I know now what he did to my children and how he did it as well. Elsie attempted suicide after the deaths of her children, and she was on high dosages of medication, including sedatives. The Birmingham Post published an article on the 31st of July 1973, following their interview with David McGreevy's father, Thomas. The father told reporters, quote, We are numbed. We are still racking our brains to find some reason for this. It is a terrible thing, but it is completely out of character. David was raised in a large family and was used to looking after younger children. He never showed any aggression. He went on to say that his family had no plans to move as they had friends in the area who wanted them to stay and he did not want to betray that friendship. McGreevy's parents had been to see him every week since his arrest but he had never talked about what had happened. In the same article, the Birmingham Post reported that Clive Ralph was living separately from his wife. Now I'd like to return to Thomas McGreevy's comment that his son's behaviour was, quote, completely out of character. The day before her murder, Samantha had been taken to hospital by her parents after she was found to have injuries to her face. One doctor wrote in her notes, query battered baby, but before this could be investigated fully, another doctor discharged her. The first doctor was so worried about Samantha's discharge that he telephoned the Ralph's own family doctor, but it was too late. A hospital spokesman said on the evening of the 30th of July that there was not enough evidence of ill treatment to detain the baby. McGreevy was also known at the local police station as his drinking often got him into trouble. In prison, there is an unspoken rule that if your crime involves children, you are marked for trouble. McGreevy was no exception. He was ostracised in prison and was subjected to frequent abuse by other prisoners. He therefore spent most of his years in prison in protected conditions. After 33 years in prison, the parole board determined that McGreevy had successfully adjusted. It was reported that he had accepted rehab and had taken up painting. In 2006, McGreevy's name appeared in the papers as he had been transferred to HMP Ford, an open prison, and was allowed to stay in a bail hostel in Liverpool. The Sun newspaper published a front page article featuring a picture of McGreevy out on temporary licence walking along a Liverpool street, along with the story of his crimes. Elsie found out about McGreevy's release via the newspaper, so she immediately went to her MP saying she was supposed to be kept informed of any movement. Shortly after this, McGreevy was transferred back to a closed Category C prison. Then, in 2009, an anonymity order was issued by the High Court of Justice during McGreevy's 7th Parole Board proceedings. The anonymity order meant that McGreevy's name and location would be kept out of any reporting. It also placed restrictions on the press coverage of the case. He was to be referred to only as Prisoner M. Other individuals with anonymity orders included John Venables, Maxine Carr and Mary Bell although their anonymity orders were lifelong and McGreevy's was not. The application was made by McGreevy's legal team, who argued that without reporting restrictions, his Article 2 right to life was breached, as was his Article 3 right to protection from degrading treatment. He also argued that his right not to be detained arbitrarily under Article 5 was being breached due to him having remained in segregated conditions as a vulnerable person in prison. The order was resisted by the British press and the Press Association. They were supported by the Secretary of State for Justice, who argued that setting such a precedent would prevent coverage of dangerous criminals. In January 2013, McGreevy applied to be transferred to an open prison, but was refused. The press was unable to publish details of McGreevy's case as the order was in place for four years. The anonymity order remained in place until the 22nd of May 2013, when it was lifted by Lord Justice Pitchford and Mr Justice Simon. They held that the public's interest in the possible release of a criminal like McGreevy was more important than any arguments made by the defence. They also held that there was a lack of imminent danger to McGreevy's life. When Elsie was asked whether McGreevy should ever be released, she unsurprisingly replied, quote, 
No way. He took three lives, not just one or two, that's bad enough, but three lives he took, and they're saying at the moment 20 years for a life. He's only done 40 years. He's took three lives. In December 2018, following a parole hearing, the report said McGreevy had changed considerably over the last 45 years, and he was legally cleared for release on parole. Elsie was informed by victim support. In a statement, the Ministry of Justice assured that McGreevy would be on licence for the rest of his life and subject to strict restrictions. He would also be subject to exclusion zones. In a BBC News article, it was reported that Elsie had had an input in, on the conditions that McGreevy would be subject to and that exclusion zones had been extended slightly following conversations with her. When speaking to BBC Hereford and Worcester, Elsie said, quote, It gives me a bit of peace of mind, but it is still not fair he has been released after what he has done. There's other prisoners that haven't done half as bad as what he did to my children, and they haven't been put up for parole. So what has made him be able to get parole? Conservative MP for Worcester, Robin Walker, stated that he didn't think McGreevy should be released after the crimes he committed. A Ministry of Justice spokesperson said the following, quote, We understand that this will be extremely distressing for the family of David McGreevy's victims, and our thoughts remain with them. Like all other life sentence prisoners released by the Independent Parole Board, David McGreevy will be on licence for the rest of his life and subject to strict conditions, and faces a return to prison if he fails to comply. And that is where this story ends. McGreevy has remained out of the headlines since his release and now lives among us, the public. I would like to know what you think. Do individuals like him deserve an opportunity to be released, to be a part of society again? And would your opinion differ if he had been a youth at the time of the offences, so that's under 18? In the future, I'll be looking at a double homicide committed by a 13-year-old. It's a case from the US. It will make for an interesting comparison, so please subscribe so you don't miss that episode. Thank you so much for joining me, and remember to keep living the dream.